So let me talk a little bit about Michael Sibley as I introduce him. Uh, he covers Hollywood for the media desk of the New York Times, uh, which means he lives in Los Angeles, right? Or somewhere around there. Yeah. Uh, he has worked as movie editor for the culture section of the Times. He joined the Times as a movie editor in 2004. Before joining the Times, he was an editor and reporter covering entertainment and media for the business section of the Los Angeles Times. And he was a reporter covering entertainment and business for various publications, including Forbes magazine and the Wall Street Journal. Prior to his career in journalism, Simply was a film and television producer and production executive with various companies, including ABC, Columbia, Disney, Fox, Universal, and United Artists. So I want to thank Michael for sharing some time with us, and we're looking forward to an interesting and engaging conversation. I live with a lot of copy editors in my life, and I want to say that there is an E in Michael, <laughs> And the, uh, the last name would be pronounced in its native Ukrainian, probably Chepwe, I suppose. And it's a, a simple, basic word that means warm. That's where it came from. Look, I'm going to violate a lifetime rule and lapse right into the first person. It's not hard to find people in journalism who'll do that. I sometimes think the motto for what's left of the news business probably should quote Albert Brooks, who said more or less in a movie called Broadcast News, let's never forget we're the real story here. But it's the only way we can get quickly acquainted and I hope learn something from each other about journalism and the arts and the whole bloody mess that passes for the news business in this early part of the 21st century. Uh, first, I'm speaking to you not from the center, but from one of the corners. I cover the movie business for the New York Times from Los Angeles. That means I'm deeply involved in about a quarter of what passes for arts coverage in the paper, and I'm reasonably remote from the rest. Technically, I report to the movie media desk, which slices, dices, doles me out to various sections, mostly to the daily culture section, but also to business, to styles, to travel, to national, and just about anybody else who will print a word that I can get into the paper. But I'm a little better schooled than the average reporter. I spent two years as the movie editor of the Times. I lived in Los Angeles. It's highly unusual to do that because outside of Washington, virtually all the Times editors are in New York. But I love it where I am, and they were good enough to let me keep an apartment there on my dime, split my time between there and Los Angeles. And I did get to know some of the things that might interest some of you who really don't care about the movies. I'm not a lifer at the Times. I've been an inveterate, happy job hopper. I've worked there eight years, and it's probably the longest that I've ever spent in a single job. Worked twice on the LA Times, once each on Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, Inside.com. Written for a lot of magazines, including Esquire, Details, and Talk Magazine, when there was such a thing. For nine years, between 1991 and 2000, I left journalism and produced, or more often tried to produce, movies and television programs. Almost all of that time, I was on the Columbia Pictures lot. I didn't love it, but I learned a lot more than I ever wanted to know about life inside the walls, and it's just like watching the player. With that out of the way, I've got some strong thoughts about journalism in general, and the times in particular. Generally speaking, I think we're in a period of maximum chaos for all the reasons that you already understand. The web has destroyed or seriously eroded the old reporting structures, the last time I worked at the Los Angeles Times, which was 2004, we had about 1,200 editorial employees. I think there are about 450 today, and that means I've got about 700 friends who are calling me all the time asking, where can I go, what can I do? There's a vast amount of information almost everywhere. When a story breaks, it's almost impossible now to get ahead of the wave. But an amazing amount of what passes for information gets repeated tens of thousands of times is wrong, and it's more wrong today than it was a year ago, that this is a deteriorating situation. You get a movie, sheet, movie theater shooter in Colorado identified instantly as a Tea Party activist when he wasn't, and that's repeated. Tony Scott, one of the big directors, jumps off of a bridge supposedly because of a brain tumor reported on ABC and repeated thousands of times when the coroner says blatantly he did not have that tumor. 
In the movie world, and this holds for the other pop arts like television, books, and theater, we've got a powerful group of publicist-fed websites that instantly report enormous amounts of industry trivia. Most of it doesn't mean anything. It's like gravel against a window. The few of us who still work and get paid in places like the Times every day come under enormous pressure from nervous, traffic-oriented editors and ourselves to chase little bits of gravel. But the better reporters I know are still mean, stubborn people who really want to haul back, throw a bigger rock, and break the window. Sometimes it still happens. These are not always enormous stories, but sometimes with something, we get there first or bigger or better. As for the paper, I don't think the executive editor herself could give you a coherent explanation of the current philosophy of coverage and the interplay between print and the other media as it applies to the arts or anything. I asked the culture editor, John Landman, what his strategy was, what he would like to express to you, and he said, look, no doping and don't take bribes. In Jill Abramson's case, she's the, the executive editor, it's not because she's not smart or a focused woman. I worked with Jill almost 30 years ago on the Wall Street Journal, and I can tell you she's only smarter and more focused and a whole lot tougher today than she was then. But the confusion is because out of necessity, this is a time of experiment. The Times has turned into a laboratory, and every single thinking reporter on the paper every day of the week is trying to find a personal accommodation between the pressures for instant delivery and the age-old yearning for depth. A valid motto for the paper might be depth, period, now, period. In truth, particularly in the arts, what you'll see in the paper is a mixture, and it's often bewildering to me of smart, analytical, even investigative classic journalism with things, particularly in the arts, that verge on shameless promotion. There's a great urge to use video, but not all of it's good. You wouldn't have to look very far on the Times website to find Times people on camera interviewing each other about one thing or another. It's right out of Albert Brooks. The blogs are uneven, partly because they're centrally edited. In the middle of a working day when our hundreds of editors and producers are at their desks, the arts blogs or a media blog can be a very fast, aggressive way to get something out. When they're not at their desks, an item can sit for 16 hours before it actually hits the internet. In fact, it's all a work in progress. But with all that said, the Times remains an amazingly robust well of information and original thinking, and particularly about the arts. When I was the movie editor, we had days on which we moved as many as 23 full-blown byline stories about film. We were generating as much copy as the trade papers, and most of it was smarter. Overall, the Times Arts coverage comes in two big blocks, repertorial and critical. The critics have long been an outsized presence on the paper. In some of the arts, like theater and classical music, they actually fulfill the paper's overall self-image, which at some level has something to do with an urge, which I don't particularly share, to set the world's agenda. If you look closely at the daily culture age, you'll see a lot of logos and ragged right columns. Those are the critics, to the chagrin of the reporters, that take up as many as four of the five available cover slots on some days. But their saving grace is that they're extremely smart and extremely hardworking. On the internal email system, you can see them filing all weekend long and all night. In fine art, dance, theater, classical music, the coverage of the Times is fairly New York-centric. There had been an impulse a decade ago toward the national, but Rupert Murdoch's push into New York with a home edition of the Wall Street Journal pushed the Times a little bit back into a defense of its New York core. For the record, London's treated as part of New York in the arts, particularly in the theater world. Los Angeles is treated as part of New York for the purpose of movies. Two of us, Brooks Barnes and myself, Brooks Barnes and myself, cover film as reporters. We do sometimes interview movie stars and filmmakers. Those stories get readers, but a lot of star interviews, when badly handled, can be dumber than a locker room interview. On other days, it turns deadly serious. Movie people get in a lot of trouble. Roman Polanski gets caught. A few years ago, I was writing three different guys who wound up in federal prison in one year. Brooks has been working for weeks on stories about, yet to be published, about the innocence of Muslims, the picture that set the Muslim world on fire. In between, there are business stories, Oscar speculation, theater shootings, Lindsay Lohan. 
we both start at about 6 a.m. every morning. We work until about 7. We get paid for about seven and a half of those hours, but it's still a lot of fun. And with that said, I love questions. I would just love to be able to get engaged with all of you in, in a conversation about anything that might interest you. I don't care if it's the movies, the journalism, the times, where we're all headed. But uh, I've just found that a couple of small groups here are fabulous audiences. And um, I hope we can find a way to throw this open. And please ask, and I'll tell you anything I know, or I'll tell you what I don't know. Yes. Mike's available for questions. Anybody need it? Yeah. Okay. So you said that the eight years is the longest that you've been in any position. It is. So what is your average, I mean, how short was the shortest one? I'm just wondering how you went through all those Well, a lot of them kind of escalated in some kind of thing. It was like two years at Forbes, uh, four years, three years at the Wall Street Journal, four years at the, the LA Times. Um, in various positions, I spent nine years producing, but. But you know, it kind of broke down to where I was working for another guy, and then after two years, wound up with my own production deal, and that was kind of a freeform, self-employed thing for about seven years. Went back for about two to the LA Times, and then somebody called up from the New York Times and said, "Hey, um, you're stealing four of your <laughs> three, three of your colleagues today. We want you to join them." And I thought, since the LA Times was sinking, that sounded like a very, very good idea. So. Um, you know, that, the, the eight years, partly because it's a great paper, it's a great place to be, it's, it's what's left in, in rock-hard conventional journalism. And it's also, uh, there's nowhere to go. This is an island with rising waters. And many of the great people I know in this business who love the places they work are kind of flocking to the New York Times because it's still got a paper. It's still there. How's your voice? You need this or? No. If you, if you'll shout. I'll shout back. Um, I just wanted to know your opinion on kind of what's happened to film criticism in general with the rise of the internet. If you think there is less value in kind of the uh, opinions of a handful of experienced critics in comparison to the hundreds of blog sites and consensus ratings. I'll give you a different answer than I would have uh, two or three years ago. I'll tell you, when I was editing the critics, I did for two years, I edited, well, I'm going to tell you, editing New York Times critics is a hell of an experience. The, the way you edit Manola Dargis is basically the copy comes in and you tiptoe down to about the seventh draft and you might spot a word there and say, Manola, would it be all right if we sort of took this word out? And then she sends back an email and says, no, I want my words. <laughs> and you look at it and you say, okay, you're edited, on you go, you know, you're, you're in, because they're very empowered people. But uh, basically, it, there was a big debate that was occurring publicly, I, I want to say maybe four years ago, that said, is criticism dead? And there, there, was a, there were a series of major papers that canned their critics. Uh, the, the aggregated web criticism on Rotten Tomatoes and some of the more uh, sophisticated versions of it, like movie review intelligence, or, looked like it was taking over. And somebody on a website called Movie City News actually started a death watch of movie critics. And they listed all the employed print critics in America. And they were going to tick them off as they were fired and died. And they went one, two, three. And it stopped. It just stopped. And the rest never got fired. It didn't happen. And it's as if there's something, like the, the, it plumbed the bottom. And whatever the enduring validity of, of conventional print criticism is, it seemed to assert itself and stay there. And I, I think, I mean, I suspect I know a little bit about why that happened. I don't know all the reasons, but I'll tell you that one of them is that until you edit them, you almost can't appreciate how hard critics work to do what they do. I mean, I never, I never paid much attention, and I didn't understand how repertorial, for instance, the critics are. But, you know, Manola, who will go off in a flame of words in all directions, um, does a vast amount of research before she'll write a word. I've seen her walking around the 600-page book in order to get a paragraph in a movie review. And she is the bane of the motion picture, you know, Academy Motion Picture Arts and Sciences Library because they have a telephone reference service and the MOLA, before she's writing a review, gets on there and starts hammering for this and that and the other thing. I think in some ways it's 
It's the density of what they do, as opposed to the, the, the hip shot opinionated nature of what others do that kept the, the, the major critics alive. They get an enormous response. Because I would like on any story I've ever written to have just the hate mail they get, never mind the, the good ones. But they, they get huge, passionate, passionate response. So I think it's alive and well. And I, I would have been with the people saying it's on the way out a few years ago. I was just dead wrong. Anyone? Yes, please. Um, you said that you work from like 6 a.m. until 7, and you get paid for like seven and a half hours of that, but it's totally worth it. What yeah. is the best part of your job? Oh, God, it's just being out of the office. I mean, look, there, there's only one reason to be a reporter in life, and I've always, I've always used that word. I never let anybody call me a writer. I, I just, you know, it's not that I don't respect writers. I think they're wonderful, but I just, that's not my function. My function is to like turn over rocks and see if something good there, bad there, is it there. And it, um, it doesn't go away. It's, it's kind of addictive, and it had a lot to do in a very weird, almost perverted way for, with my reasons many, many, many years ago for wanting to become a reporter. I, I actually remember in the late 1970s being in a coffee shop in San Francisco where I was employed at the time as a typist in a legal publisher, just typing manuscript all day long, and my wrist blew up like that. And I was reading the New York Times, and I was thinking, this is weird, because I'm reading this story, and it's formulaic. I mean, it's, it's like not the way people really talk. People don't call each other Mr. and Ms. and Mrs. Uh, it's not complete. You know, it's a thousand words, but it's taking a bite out of this huge, vast, complicated reality of people. It's not, um, it, it, it feels like kabuki and like the real story somewhere between the spaces. And I remember thinking, God, the only way I'm ever going to break down the plexiglass wall between me and the reality, the real story, to just get a bite out of life is if I'm the reporter and my stories might come out as formulaic and it's kabuki like as anybody else's, but at least I have looked in the box. I just always wanted to look in that box. And I, to my chagrin, it never went away. I left it. I left it for nine years. In my worst year of producing, I made more money than my best year in journalism. And I couldn't live without it. I just had to come back. Yes, please. Um, can you kind of elaborate more on like, what do you feel like the importance of news media is and what do you think like the New York Times compared to what they're today? Wait, please just a, a little bit. You have to shout the last half. No, um, and what do you think the importance of like, the New York Times is in our culture, especially since we're a growing um, younger generation and more technology culture? You know, uh, look, it's, to me, I think all of this vast wave of every kind of way of delivering information, I think we desperately need it all. I mean, I, I have always been someone who kind of agreed with something that I'm embarrassed to say I can't remember the exact essay or book it came from that, that John Stuart Mill wrote in the mid 19th century, basically saying that nobody in journalism is ever going to get it utterly right, that newspapers are inherently defective, inherently agendized, inherently whatever, but that the great multiplicity of sources of information might, on a bright and sunny day, yield an approximation of the truth. And that, that seems to me as valid today as it was there, like we need it all. And I don't believe in any sacred church of journalism that says, okay, this institution or that institution is going to be the one that's going to be so thorough and so complete that they're going to defy the, the, all the laws of human nature and get it utterly right, not going to happen. But with that said, I think that we absolutely can't let go of institutions, not just one, the New York Times, and God willing keep the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post and whatever else is still around, that have the wherewithal to have people spend time and money in any kind of front line, physical, genuine reporting. Uh, the, the scary, uh, Deception of the internet is, and, and we all fall for it. I fall for it too. I sit there and I'm like typing, thinking, you know, okay, get, 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 can I get my story? Get my story. And you, the deception is that you can somehow get anything, any piece of information in life through.
through that screen. You can't. You have to go out there and talk to people and put in the dipstick and turn over the record and stories, more stories today are lying hidden in court records that never get turned over or in interviews that never occur or whatever than there were 20 years ago. I'm telling you that the actual gritty, just not investigation, but day to day, turn over the rock and see what's under their reporting is diminishing. But there is far more repetition, almost verbatim repetition, if you look at a Google search, of the first wave of information that burns across the top. I'll, I'll give you an example of that. What I think the New York Times can do, and, and I shouldn't do this, I'll blow one of my own stories, but let somebody beat me to it, it's fine. We had an incident in Los Angeles uh, nine weeks ago where one of the biggest directors in town, Tony Scott, on Friday goes out to Las Vegas and he scouts Top Gun 2 with Tom Cruise and Paramount's hot to make the movie. And they're going to have, you know, he's 68 years old, but he's kicking. He just made a picture. He's going to make this picture. Owns a big company. It's Friday. Sunday morning, Tony Scott takes his Prius, drives up to the top of the Vincent Thomas suspension bridge, and at 12.30 in the afternoon, dives off in front of the Catalina Ferry and hundreds of people, and he's dead. Now we're sitting there wondering, now there was a first wave of all, you can read 10,000 stories about Tony Scott taking a dive. I don't know to this day why he did it. What happened? You know, did Tom Cruise tell him he's too old? Was it a personal thing? Did he have a personal problem? Was he sick? What I do know is that somewhere hiding in there is one of the best human stories that has crossed the world I live in for years. Now, there aren't very many publications left that have the time to invest in figuring that out. And it's very hard to do. It's delicate, it's personal. Some of the answers, if they're, you know, about, you know, if his wife said something, whatever, maybe they're things we wouldn't even print. But I think the importance of a thing like the New York Times is that it's a paper that still has enough money and will to take a little bit of time and start ringing the phone and talking to people and saying, hey, Ridley, your brother Tony, come on, talk to us a little bit. At least give us a sense he's got, he's got right here in this town 150 people who love them who are calling us every day wondering what happened to Tony. And if we don't figure it out, somebody else needs to figure it out, but somebody's got to be there to figure it out, or we're living in, in a kind of diminished society. Yes, please. Not nearly enough. I mean, look, the, the, the movie watching part of our enterprise is first and foremost the critics. And they, they really, they watch them in the end, they watch them professionally. They watch them with a judgmental eye. They, they if they catch the reporters out there passing judgment on a movie, they, they would get in a big fist fight because they don't like us using, and, and the, where you know you're in trouble is if you say something about a movie, write something about a movie, that a company then picks up and they put in their advertising block. You know, it's like, oh, it's a razzle-dazzle. It said Michael Sipley of the New York Times. I, mean, I get a call from Tony or Manolo and say, what the hell, what are you doing that for? You know, don't, don't be. So, so we don't, you know, kind of um, as religiously watch them as they do, okay? But you have to see them and you have to understand them. You cannot possibly watch nearly as many as are made or even released. I mean, there, there are about five to 6,000 movies a year, feature films, being sent to Sundance. There are about 600 or so a year being reviewed in the New York Times. So you'd have to watch two a day to see just the ones that are being released on a screen, you know, commercially. Uh, what tends to happen, there are a couple of things. I'll, I'll get out to, maybe once a week, something fairly current. Uh, my wife and I will catch up every single day on some movie, you know, on, on, uh, on disc or on television, on DVD, whatever. We're lucky enough in the tail end of the year to get a fair number of screeners of pictures that haven't been released yet so that you can get a peek at things that have not yet occurred. And it's not a great way to watch them, but just given the length of the day, you've got to watch them on DVD. I can't drag it across Los Angeles for an hour and a half in each direction after working 12 hours and watch a two-hour movie. But, but I'm going to say about seven a week, 
And then occasionally we will, um, we alternate, Brooks and I will get to a, a film festival, and there you do the dirtiest kind of watching it of all because we're generally working against multiple deadlines, have to deliver a lot of copy. It would be 300 movies at the Toronto Film Festival, and what you wind up doing is diving in and out and watching 10 and 15 minutes and learning enough to kind of fit it in to something that can be delivered an hour from now in a piece of prose. And out of respect to the filmmaker, you have to come back and watch those movies again later. You can't just do that to somebody. You, know, you have to see them. So quite a bit, but not nearly enough. Is there a difference in the journalistic process between entertainment, Hollywood reporting, as opposed to political reporting? There shouldn't be. I mean, that, look, there's a deep kinship between political reporting and Hollywood reporting. And so it's a lot of the same dynamic. People are as smart, it's as competitive, I mean, it's mean, dirty competitive, because everybody, everybody reports a little bit on movies. Moment. You can get hit from the side by ABC, you can get hit by the crummy little blog, you can get hit by the New Yorker, you can get hit, you know, a movie story can come at you from a thousand places, and any day of the week you can wake up and somebody will say, that would have been a good story for us, why did we not do that? So, so you know, you really are, you have the same level of intensity even though many of the stories, not all of them, are trivial. Okay, so the, the bottom line is, you know, sometimes you're dealing with uh, trivial matter, but intense pursuit of it, and that's pretty weird. Um, the repertory of techniques on the serious stories, the real ones, and they're happening all the time, the ones that take you particularly to the courthouses and everything else, it's the same. I mean, there's, a, there's not two sets of law for a movie story and, and a real story. It's only a little bit harder than reporting outside of the movie world because the people that you're up against in that world are so good at closing the door. They don't care. Believe me, if you think that, if I pick up the telephone and I call somebody, and I've done this 30 years at these studios, say, oh, I'm from the New York Times, I wanna know da, 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 da. Nothing, dead flat. They're tough, they're, they have a, a huge public relations machinery wrapped around them. And Brooks and I have repeatedly had the experience of good, smart colleagues elsewhere in the paper who are seasoned reporters covering anything else on earth, dipping into a movie store, and then coming to us and saying, my God, how do you do this? These people are so awful, they're so tough, they're so attentive. Um, how, how do you crack open the door? So in, in some ways, it's a little bit more difficult. Then you get the other side of the mix, and it is possible, and, I, and there are people who do this, to spend an entire career simply doing what they want you to write. You know, there's an entire publicity machinery that every day of the week starts my day by sending me 50 propositions that I should do, uh, sometimes 100, of uh, X, Y, Z, essentially promoting something that they're releasing. And you try desperately not to do very much of that because there's always somebody else who can afford that. And it's just not really... I mean, I, I think our, our fundamental mission has to be to tell the stories they don't want us to tell, and that's never easy. Yes? Kind of related to that, is there one story that you can think of in your long career that really brought great self-satisfaction to you or yeah. <laughs> great <laughs> impact? I mean, one I don't know just kind of you know, I, I don't know about impact, and I'm, I'm not deeply retrospective about individual stories. You know, I, I, there are words that um, come to me every single day of the week, which is fire and forget. You know, I just, I think to sit there and dwell or expect somebody to hold a parade when you write a story, although I have some colleagues who feel that way, is foolish. I think that the smarter thing is to do it, move on, fire and forget about it. But I, I'll tell you the one that, oddly enough, um, just, just sticks, I don't know why this sticks, but it was, it was not because it was a story of the movie world, but because the drill was so difficult. In the 1980s, you might remember, uh, back when the power story was far more interesting than it is today. I mean, you, know, you don't really read about Hollywood power reporters, or power players much anymore because there aren't any, and they're much grayer, and they're corporate, and they're diminished, and it's, it's just not there. But there was a guy named Michael Ovitz who, had managed to kind of corner the town. He was running a creative artist agency. Uh, there was a, an enormous amount of fear and loathing around him. He had all the biggest movie stars. And basically, Michael, from the center, I think a mean, tough character, and from the center of that agency, 
he, for several years, maybe five years, ran Hollywood. And they did it with a mechanism that was pretty fascinating. In, there were about six, at that point, six major studios. And what he had figured out, his basic mechanism, was that you could always sell as an agent to the weakest studio, that you, that you sell into weakness. Because if I'm representing the stars and I put together a package, the place I can get the most money is by going to weakness. Where it got brilliant is that they figured out how to create weakness. So what the creative artist agency agents under Ovitz were doing was they had a Wednesday morning film meeting and they would give out a body check award. They would figure out, going studio by studio, how to damage a studio, knock it into bottom position, weaken it, and then sell to it. And uh, the, they called that the body check award. They took this cloud of grief and for years they were moving it and this one would get in trouble and couldn't figure out why a whole Hollywood suddenly turned against me and knocking me out of jobs and whatever. Okay, so back in the, the 80s, nobody had written about it. It just, it just wasn't there. I did, he used to brag. He came into the LA Times and walked the publisher through the building at one point. And he said, go ahead, check your clips. You won't find a single story about me. And the truth was, there was one primitive story from the 70s when they had founded the agency, and that was it. There was nothing that ever, ever occurred. And I just, I, I was on the Wall Street Journal, and I was just a stubborn, horrible person. And I said, you know, I'm going to put this guy on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. It's just, if, if he's the most powerful man in Hollywood, and I was still pretty new to the, I said, this is per se, this is a journal front page story. We have to do it. And I worked, and I worked, and he had, he threatened me, and had people come to me and tell me, don't do this. And because in those days we had resources, I followed him. He, you know, I figured out where he was going. He went to New York, and he'd walk down out of the, the Carlisle into the restaurant, and I would be sitting there, because he wouldn't talk to me, and I'd be sitting there interviewing a producer, David Brown, as he walked down the stairs and looked at me about him. You know, and it was just, and he would go to a screening, and I would be sitting in the chair behind him. It was just the kind of thing that piece by piece, you had to teach him that you could do the repertory drill. I finished that story, I wrapped it up, I filed it, and my, my, in those days, the Wall Street Journal, you filed through your bureau chief. Now, we don't do that. Now, I filed direct to New York, bureau chiefs will figure that here. But my bureau chief, I adore him, he's the greatest guy on earth, his name is Barney Clay. He was our public editor just a couple of years ago, Barney was. And, and he's a tough, old, you know, just very tough Missouri guy, you know, heavy Baptist. And Barney looked at me and said, I'm, I'm not going to run. Why? He said, well, he said, I'm not going to create some guy. I don't know who this guy is. I'm just not going to create this guy. And, and, and Barney, I had 10 people at my wedding. Barney was there. I mean, we were really friends. With him. And so I fought with Barney. I just fought with this fought, fight went on and on and on. I'm sitting in the Journal Bureau. It was a 10-day fight. And finally, on the 10th day of the fight, I walked in and I said, Barney, you win. You just absolutely win. You're 100% right. We shouldn't create this guy. The only thing I'm going to ask you is, in fairness to the journal, because I just wasted a lot of their money, let me take the story, let me sell it to anybody who will buy it. Doesn't matter who it is, let me sell it. And I'll give you guys the money, and you can kind of take off the books everything that I spent going back and forth to do it. And he thought about that for five minutes and said, all right, run the next story. So, so we ran it, and it had huge impact. I mean, Vanity Fair, everybody afterwards, it started this over there. I, years later, I had lunch with Ovitz who said, you, you changed my life, and not for the better with that. So I managed to do everything in the dark. You forced me into the light. Then he went public after that, and eventually destroyed himself because he didn't work well publicly. He needed darkness in order to work. And, and the happiest thing is that Barney, who I still see all the time, years and years later, we sat down and we were having lunch over something. He said, oh, you know about that one story? You know, you were right. <laughs> so yeah, that's the one that sort of sticks, just as a lesson as to just how dogged sometimes you have to be to, to get it done. And I just always remind myself, it's the one they don't want you to tell them that you just have to do. Anyone? Yes? I have a couple questions. Um, you know, you mentioned working at the New York Times, you worked at the Los Angeles. Yeah. Time. Did you ever work at a, at a, did you start at these places or did you work at a small place? Uh, no, I, I mean, I'll tell you exactly what happened. And it's, I mean, there, there, there is maybe like one or two instructive things about this. 
I got out of college, an undergraduate, in 1973, okay? If you look at the economic cycles in the United States, the 1970s were shot. It was, it was as bad as it is now. The 73 was about the beginning of a long, grinding thing that became known as the Carter Recession. It didn't lift until about 1982. And there was no work. It just wasn't there. And so when I, you know, I went to graduate school for a couple of years. I bagged graduate school because I realized I didn't want to live in the 18th century. I told myself I was going to write and report for a living. I lived in San Francisco because so I was in graduate school at Stanford and couldn't get hired any place in any way. And it thus became a typist. And I figured out perversely that it was easier to sell a book than it was to get hired. And I grabbed my college roommate. There was a guy named, from Michigan named Lindsey Chang. He happened to be working on a Hearst paper down in Los Angeles. And because I had been an academic, I knew that there were 100,000 pieces of uh, archival correspondence from William Randolph Hearst and his family that were dumped in the University of California bankrupt library and never been used. I said, you know, if I went in there and you took what you knew and can do from the newspaper world, we could do one of these family and empire books about the Hearsts. And so as nobodies, I mean literal nobodies, we actually took us five years to do it, but we put together this book, sold it to Simon & Schuster, who was finally published in 1982, broke our hearts doing that. I mean, I can't tell you, the, the advance was $18,000. They paid, oh, no, I'm sorry, I know, it may have been 25, it was 18,000 copies. But they split it, half on delivery, half when you sign, and then you split it between two guys. So I had $6,000 for five years. I painted Victorians. I did anything that was possible to do in San Francisco to get through the process of writing that book. It was life changing because when the book was finally published, it was not a hit. Hardly, hardly made an impression, but people thought it was pretty good. Malcolm Forbes read the book, and as I was near suicidal, living for a year in Oklahoma, deep in the middle of a second book that was failing for various complicated reasons. I got a postcard from Malcolm Forbes, forwarded by my, by then, ex-wife, who had said, I hope you like my Wii Review. He had reviewed the book a year late. I sent him back a postcard, and I said, oh, not only did I like your Wii Review, but if you like the book, you should hire me. And he sends back a letter, because it was 1982, and because the economy was taking off again, and business publications had staff, that said, sure, come to New York, you've got a job. I just thought it was famous. I had borrowed money, I borrowed a car, I drove to New York, I got into New York, and I went to the managing editor of the, the magazine, whose name was Shelley Zelazinet, who was on a closing day, and that's not a good day to walk into a magazine. And he looked so glum, and he looked at this, and he said, well, sure enough, you've got a letter. Um, the only problem is Malcolm doesn't hire anybody on this paper. The, the editor, Jim Michaels, does. And Shelley said, look, I don't know, Jim's a tough. Rusty. He was just like right out of the front page. He was, he was a little guy who was claimed to fame of them when he was on UPI. He ran faster than the AP reporter when Gandhi was shot and got the scoop. You know, he was like that. And so they sent me for seven hours around the building. And at that point, I was so ragged, I had 10 ideas in my hip pocket. And finally, after like just stalling, spending time with these people, they run me up to Jim Michaels. He says, Yeah, sure, you got a letter. What are you going to do for us? I said, well, I don't know, here, I got these 10 ideas is what I like to do. And he listened to them, and he called Shelley, and he said, yeah, this guy has 10 ideas, and seven of them are actually pretty good. He can be our new Los Angeles guy. And he was like, in that car, and said, I swear to God, this, this is the height of the fall from this war, by the way. Shelley looked at me, and he said, I'm gonna tell you something. He said, you look so bad. He said, you just look like somebody chewed you up and kicked the shit out of you. He said, here's $100. Go out and get yourself something to eat. I mean, I was like starving in this business. And I walked out of there in a daze. I walked into the first restaurant to find on Fifth Avenue. It was an Argentine restaurant. The guy, nobody there, because of the Falklands War. The guy in the back was playing the Argentine national anthem on a piano. And that was it. You know, you got hired into Forbes, and Forbes turned into the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So that it, it was kind of like skipping those stepping stones but not in an easy way. <laughs> it's not, not an easy way. And, yeah? So the Los Angeles Times then is, is, is largely uh, a regional paper. It is now. Yeah. <laughs> it is now. And certainly compared to the New York Times. Yeah. Um, what would you, or how would you describe the differences between working for the uh, Los Angeles Times? Oh, it's 
the New York Times. It's fascinating. New York Times. Uh, first of all, I'm going to tell you that there are about 60 people on the New York Times from the Los Angeles Times. And that's a lot. I mean, that's really a lot. But the, look, it's changed across time. The, the LA Times is very diminished now. You know, it's just not what it was, and it's retreated back toward its original core. But if you went to the, the 70s, 80s, and the 90s, the Los Angeles Times had enormous ambitions to be a national paper. Back in those days, the catch was the Pacific Rim. Okay. So, so they were going to plant the flag and they were going to run the world from the Pacific Rim. And they were supposed to be as good as, as big as, whatever, everything else. Now, the actual truth of the dynamic, if you were a reporter for that, is that it's much, 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 much harder in, in that heyday to do your work from the Los Angeles Times than it was from either the Journal or the New York Times. And it basically, other than local stories, they got no handouts or no gimmicks. If, if there was a national political story and it was coming out of Washington, and particularly if it fell comfortably within the, the, the right ideological track, it was going to get handed to the New York Times. If there was a big business story that was going to break, it was going to get handed to the Wall Street Journal. So people on the Los Angeles Times had to be way hungrier and way cagier and far more repertorial than people on the other papers. And I, look, I, I love the New York Times. I'm so grateful that I'm delighted to be there. It's a great paper. But I'm going to tell you to this day that the, the, the habits of the average person on the New York Times are not as repertorial as the habits of the average person on the Los Angeles Times because those people had to learn how to scale a glass wall in order to get what they wanted. Whereas many people on the New York Times could, if they wanted to, flow through a career kind of doing what an editor wanted them to do or kind of doing, there's always something that somebody is gonna make available to you because it's a great platform and you can kind of just keep grabbing the available and going down the easy path. It takes a very professional eye to distinguish between the two, but, but they are quite different. And that's why the, the saving grace in the New York Times is that it's gone way out of its way to hire the, the repertorial personalities from these other papers. The big contingent of people from the Philadelphia Inquirer, and it's for the same reason the Inquirer is always a repertorial paper. And then there are at least 60 of those as well on the New York Times. That's kind How of does that relate to the critics? columnists as well. Well, no, the critics are, uh, and columnists are just a completely different beast. They just live in a completely different world. And I, I think, basically, they have, all of them, uh, you know, they, they kind of brand name. They have, they have a personal celebrity value in their universes. And I think that the, uh, a critic, most critics that I know, don't like being in touch with the people that they write about. Movie critics, the movie critics. Just hate it. They don't like the interview or, or even have a conversation with most filmmakers. Some do, you know, they're not the ones I know because they feel like it compromises their ability to, to write with utter, utter cold detachment. And so they're, they're kind of different beasts. They don't have the same, and, and you know, look, Manola was the same critic on the LA Times that she is on the New York Times and was the same critic on the, the LA Weekly. You know, she just, it hasn't particularly changed her, and I don't think what she does changes. I think it's a little more uniform and a little more personal to the individual. Anything? Yes? So many answers to this, and some of them will get me shot. And you know, I got to think about how they all fit together. It's a great question. It's an important question. I think one of the most intelligent things that I've seen said about this lately was something that um, our outgoing public editor wrote in what I think was his last column before he he moved on to uh, he ended his gig. You know, it's a terminal gig, and they hire a new one. And kind of roughly speaking, what his bottom line was after two years of serving the paper. He said, you know, the actual central core assigned political reporters behave 
very well. They, they are professional, they run the drill, they really do kind of more or less, you know, get at the pike pole and measure and see that they've kind of, this one said, that one said, you know, run it up and run it out and do it very honestly. And I think one measure of the validity of what he said is that internally at the paper, what people do political reporting about is that they get just battered, not by the right, but by the left. You know, people send them emails and they're wanting to be, so I think that's true. But the other half of what he said is that the core fiber of the paper is so liberally skewed that if you follow the way stories run through all of the other sections, through, you know, when you're, when you're outside of that immediate, simple, I'm covering a debate, you know, when you're outside of that central drill, that there is a lot of skew and agenda that leaks into the stories. He said, and he said he found, after two years of being there, uh, a great deal of ideological uniformity among the people who put out the paper. And I think that's utterly true. I just don't, I don't think there's a, a word of misstep in what he said. Um, I remember when I was first hired here as an editor, and we went through some training sessions, and one very high editor there said, you know, we were in, we were in a training session, we were starting a, a thing, and he was talking, he said, yeah, this is a liberal way. This is exactly what we are, and it's who we are, and what we should be. I was thinking, you know, it's probably true, and maybe the best thing to do is to run it up the flagpole and just take credit for it, be it. But it's, uh, as a personal matter, what I find is, look, I, I kind of detached, seriously detached, years ago, from political thinking. I mean, it just, my brain blew out. I just I thought, you know what, we're living in a state of permanent campaign now, and I just don't feel like being part of a permanent campaign. I'm too old, too many other things I love, and I don't want to be in a partisan debate every day of the week. And I started to drift away, and as a matter of personality, I sank down into the movies. I love the movies. It's a great way to get a, a handle on so many chunks of life and everything else. And it's been kind of a, a refuge for that. And I have to say that in covering the movies, um, there have only been four or five instances in seven years in which an editor started to lean on me to do something that I thought was really kind of fraught with political agenda. And I told him to bag it, and nobody came back and fired him. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it's there, but I think that uh, any good, strong reporter in the place uh, can operate without being snagged by it. And I think that what the public editor said about the mainline central political enterprise is, is pretty true. They, they, they really, you know, try to adhere to by their lights. But, but again, it comes back to what John Stuart Mill said. Everybody, every, everybody is, you know, it's, it's, it's built into perceptual psychology that we're all going to see things from our own point of view. And that's why you got to have a bunch of papers. You got to have a bunch of avenues. If that's it, I, I thank you very, very much. I mean, this is a fabulous school. I thank all of you for the chance to, to being able to meet over about four sessions. Uh, a lot of smart people. Thank you. Thank you for coming.